All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Ben Worthen, who is up the coast a little bit in Oakland, California. How are you doing, Ben? I'm doing well. How are you? Great, great. And Ben's the CEO of Message Lab and spent several years combining journalism, data and design to help organizations create content that resonates with real people. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is taking advantage of non-sales moments to drive growth. Um, so maybe we just start off, Ben, with your definition of what, what do you mean by a non-sales moment? So what I mean is, it's very natural in the case of a company, you know, you have a product, everything is incentivized towards selling, you know, that's how you stay in business. That's how you grow. And it tends to force us to think of people as customers or as prospects. When in reality, a person is only a customer or a prospect for a small amount of time. Most of the time, they're just a person. And people have needs that don't necessarily align perfectly to our products. Now, they might be tangential, you know, and even if you're thinking about a professional who's doing a job and you have a tool that can help them do their job better, um, yes, you know, there are, there are prospects through the minds of the company, but to them, you know, in their own mind, there's a person who's trying to do their job better. And, you know, in most of the time, they're going to be thinking about, you know, other questions that don't necessarily relate to the product that you're selling, but probably fit into the broader universe of, you know, why does your product exist? What, what is your company's mission to help people with? And that kind of thing. So, you know, the idea of trying to think about and establishing this, this sense of a non-sales moment mm -hmm. is how do you help someone? How do you relate to them? How do you engage with them when they don't want to buy your product? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you ensure that, you know, I, I don't mean uh, salespeople sort of do sure. this innately, right? Like you, you call someone up and you're able to, um, you know, instantly figure out like, is this person going to buy or not? And if not, you pivot the conversation to something else. And, and it's very natural for these people, but, but in a world that, you know, message lab and many other people inhabit, it's, it's marketing, which tends to be one to many and not one to one. So how do you take that same thing that, you know, again, the best salespeople do very naturally and do it on a one to many basis. Um, and, and the answer as we see it is, is you make things that are meant to engage people around ideas that they care about, around, you know, in, they're gonna inform them, they're gonna entertain them and somehow provide value to them when, you know, when they're not in that customer mode. Right, so in order to do that, obviously, I mean, you have to create value. You have to do something that, uh, resonates with them, right? Because obviously just you know, mm -hmm. traditionally marketing at people um, isn't the same thing. So you have to, you have to be a lot more creative, right? Yeah, that's what, that's what we think. And, and we think it begins with just exactly going through the process you described, you know, getting outside your own head a little bit, you know, getting outside the walls of your company and thinking about, you know, what are the things that this person is going to care about at all the other moments of their life? Um, and again, it could be, you know, uh, if you're selling something to help parents, you know, what are concerns that parents have? You know, if you're, if you're selling software to a business, you know, what are the concerns that a project manager has, um, you know, just on a day-to-day -day basis? And, and how do you then have a conversation with them about those things and provide something of value? Again, that's not about your product. Yeah, because it's interesting because you, as you said, I mean, good sales people do this innately, but, uh, you know, sometimes in the marketing messaging, even a lot of other salespeople, as you said, they, they, they think unless they're being quite direct and very mm -hmm. much on a sales path, or if you're not in sales, like driving towards sales, that that is, that's the only thing that's really valid. <laughs> Yeah, or, or, or you qualify someone and you are writing them through, you're, you're applying the filter of, are they ready to buy now? And if they're not ready to buy now, it becomes, oh, okay, well, let's talk later on. And you don't think about, you know, the fact that like, well, it's like 90% of the time someone's not ready to buy. What can we do to nurture a relationship with you during those moments so that when you do want to buy, you know, you yeah. want to buy from us or you want to buy more. Mm -hmm. 
you know, um, yeah. and, 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 and so I can give you some examples of the way we do Yeah, it. please do, please do. Um, so, so a lot of what we do, and, and, and so by background, Message Lab uh, and myself, I was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal for years and years, and we have a team of people who've been, you know, journalists and places like that. And it, it, there's no reason that you have to have been a journalist in order to be able to do this, um, but it's kind of the training you get. And, and, and it's almost like we try to think of the, the life of the people that our clients are trying to reach as a beat, same way you would as a newspaper mm, reporter. And, right. and, and I have had over and over and over again, an editor come up to me and be like, yeah, well, why does anybody care? Why does anybody care? Why does anybody care? And, and that has caused me to learn how to go out and find a story, not just you know, sit here and um, you know, write something but to go out and talk to people, to to find out, hey John, you know, what are the things? What are your experiences? And then how can I take your experience and craft it in a way, not so it's a case study, you know, where mm-hmm. it's about how you use the product, but more about how did John, you know, overcome this problem that other people who are trying to reach can relate to, and you know, by by you know pivoting it that way, and sure you make the case study too, you know, and sure. then people can read that if they want to, but you're providing something of value. Um, for someone who isn't ready to do that. They just want to sort of learn how someone can solve the problem they could relate to or data, you know, data that can help someone make a better decision is the other thing that we hear people want all the time. Yeah, and it's interesting you said that about about journalism because, you know, obviously if you just write about what you think, I mean, that's an opinion piece. It's Mm -hmm. it's maybe mildly interesting uh, or not. Uh, However, if if, if there are if there are people or stories or things in the article that resonate with me and I can relate to, then obviously I'm more engaged with the piece. Yeah, and, and I'll say, you know, if you go back to the world of publishing for a minute, you know, the best, of column, the best opinion columnists aren't just sitting there and thinking and coming up with an idea. They're out there talking to people and shaping their ideas as well. And then sure, those people may not be quoted in the piece, but they're having conversations all the time and they're getting new inputs and they're seeing how people react. And, and so, you know, when we're working with clients for that, we're trying to do that as well. We're trying to help bring an outside point of view to shape you, shape the thing that you want to say. Um, but then, yes, there's this whole other aspect of storytelling where you have a topic, you have an idea, you have something you want to talk about. Then you have to go off and do the work to figure out how do I turn this into something that's compelling. Uh, one of my favorites that we did was we were working with a client that was trying to look at how small businesses were surviving the earliest days of COVID, and mm-hmm. um, and we found this town in Iowa where there was like a small little town, but had a lot of these entrepreneurs. And there was this guy who had a horse massage business. And um, and he had to figure out how do you do horse massage online over the internet, like. <laughs> Who doesn't yeah. want to read about online horse massage, right? Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, so things like that, where, where you just kind of pull on some thread and you find something you can package it up in a way that's interesting and compelling to people. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great example. Yeah, who doesn't love a horse massage um, <laughs> story? Um, but but the other part is, yeah, I think sometimes a lot of companies struggle with this because they struggle with really understanding who, not just who their buyer mm-hmm. is, but but what are the issues or, or challenges or opportunities that they face? Because you'll always go, if you say to somebody, do you know who your buyer is? They'll probably always say, oh, yes, yes, yes. But if you really ask them to, to explain it and detail it, you'll often find it's a very superficial understanding or worse, it's an outdated one. Yeah. And in fact, you know, personas, right? It's yep. kind of what you're talking about. And, mm-hmm. and when we think about the persona work that most companies have, it is through the lens of that buying moment. It's not looking at them as a person. You know, we try to pivot that and we try to create reader personas. Uh, so, uh, you know, who is it? What is this person's needs as they are in the world? You know, what are the things that they care about? Um, you know, a couple of other exercises we'll do is, you know, trying to say that, like, we're, you know, your company exists to solve a problem in culture. Um, and, and the problem as a category is much bigger than the product that you sell. You know, you are, you have, you are attacking it in one way. And there are other people who are attacking it in other ways. Some are similar, some aren't. But what's that problem? Can we focus on the problem in culture that you're trying to combat? And then trying to think about how do we use that to put us in a position where we're having empathy for the person that you're trying to reach and beginning to reflect on, you know, maybe it's not software that they need um, or, or at now, maybe they just need to like find people with better skills or they need some training, you know, or something like that. 
um, or, or they need help figuring out how have people structured their organizations, things like that. Um, and, and so that's a so that's a, that's one exercise that we do. The only the other exercise that I'll mention that we do is it's a metaphor that we use where everybody has a sense of what their store is, what what the products that they have in their mm -hmm. store is. But if you were to build on top of that or adjacent to it an idea store, where what you had all this all the shelves were stocked with ideas that you and your colleagues and your company have, what are the things that would be on the shelves? And then can we figure out a way? to sell your ideas, to make people repeat customers of your ideas with the understanding that then they'll kind of go next door and check out the product store. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. That, that's a great way of putting it. And I love what you just said a moment ago about leader personas, because I definitely think that if you look at a lot of marketing, sales, collateral, websites and everything, you won't, you won't really see reader personas. You will, you will see a lot of marketing spiel, but I mean, it's mm -hmm. very rare that you will say, oh, that's me. Right. No, it's always, you know, what is the problem this person has? And it's always very closely aligned to the product that you're mm -hmm. selling, which again, is actually very helpful in that sales moment. But, you know, if we step back and, and sort of stipulate that that's 10% of the time in that reader that person's life you know what do you do in the other 90 percent yeah and how are you making sure that you are not uh, that you're not spreading yourself too thin as well and um, you know going as i say you know maybe not being targeted enough in, in what you do because there is it's probably a danger that you could start to go a little broad yeah and in fact i think the biggest risk that we see is um doing art sort of what we call it like when we when we're just making something because it's cool and engaging and interesting but it doesn't actually help a client you know yeah. uh, we do it in a couple of ways you know one is um at a baseline strategy level we're pretty rigid at the beginning of defining right. who is the audience what are the key messages that tie back to you know your goals from a sales and marketing standpoint that we can express through content now we run that marketing message through the filter of what can we get someone to care about but it's still there and it's still documented for every asset that we make the other thing we do is we're big believers in data um, to the point where you know, we don't believe that someone is going to come to, you know, that cool article about horse massage and then click the button to buy software. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we do believe that over time, people who engage with our ideas, with our content, you know, over and over and over again are more likely to become a customer. And that you can show. Now, it's not as easy as saying what percentage of people came to this page and clicked buy now, but just because it's hard doesn't mean it can't be done. So we do a lot of work with our clients to make sure that their analytics are configured in such a way where we're actually measuring the things that matter in terms of figuring out whether the right people are engaging with the right ideas and also what are they doing next, whether that happens in that same session or later on when they're at a different moment. Yeah, no, that's, I think those are, those are, those are great points. And just going back to your, to your point about doing things, things that are, that are cool or that you think are, are, are cool without, you know, really understanding or asking like, what's the benefit? I did, for instance, I, I did uh, many years ago now at the University of Michigan, I did a, a lean office uh, course or certificate, whatever it was at the time. And the thing that always struck me afterwards was as part of when you're laying out the whole workflow processes, one of the things that in the lean uh, methodology that you have to ask is, if I said to a customer that, $10 of what they're paying me is going towards this part, would they say, give me the $10 back and don't do that? Oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> uh, I mean, that, that's, that's, a great, that's a great exercise to do. And in my reflexive answer to that is for the work that we do, the way you would cost justify it in that model is by saying, yes, as a customer, you've created something of value to me. And yeah, sure, maybe I still want the product cheaper, but it's but it's but if your job, bigger picture, step back, et cetera, is to make me a better version of the thing that I'm trying to achieve, a better school teacher, a better uh, project manager, a better parent, a better whatever I am, basketball player. Um, you know, your product, you know, my Nike sneakers are going to help me jump higher. But if you give me a lot of information about how I can, you know, optimize my workout routine, you know, that's going to help me too. Uh, now, 
it has to be good though to cost justify it the way you framed it, right? It's an argument. You can't just do the same old tired BS content that everybody else is doing because that's a commodity and nobody wants to pay for that. Yeah. Uh, so I would I would hope that you know what what your exercise, which I love, is 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 making a case for is if you're going to do it, do it well. Um, yeah. Make it sure it is valuable. Don't just create noise, but create things that are going to stand out as signals. No, absolutely. And the other thing you just mentioned there on metrics, and I think again, this is uh, this is a, an interesting point because let's face it, today you can you, know, you can gather as much data as you want. You can overload yourself with data, mm -hmm. and I think that's part of the problem that people fall into often into two buckets. They either think, "Oh, well, this is too complicated. I'm not going to even do a load of metrics." Or they go, oh, look at all these metrics, and they start gathering ones that don't matter. Um, the thing about really defining what you should be tracking, I think that is so critical, especially today, because you could just lose yourself in tracking everything. Yeah, and we've, I mean, we've been there. We have a team of data analysts who, you know, it's kind of fun to geek out. Mm -hmm. You know, for us, we make a distinction between data, the thing that you're measuring and then analysis or mm -hmm. insights, which is really what you want. You know, you don't, you know, no one just wants to be overwhelmed with data. What you really want to do is figure out, um, tell me how I can take action to make things better or tell me how my investment is paying off. And, and that is going to come through most likely a person looking at data and knowing what to do with it. But in order to get there, you have to have identified what's important, um, what is the job that we want the content or whatever it is that we're measuring to do, uh, what are the expected behaviors that we hypothesize are going to take place, and then we can ask ourselves, are they happening? Or are people spending time with idea A or are they spending more time with idea B? You know, it, maybe we should do more about idea B if people are spending more time with that. Uh, so those are the kind of things that we look for. But again, at, at the basis, what we're trying to do is, is kind of break time and space a little bit because we're yeah. not assuming that someone's going to take an unnatural reaction of going from directly from that idea store into the product store. Uh, you know, we we just assume that it's going to be a journey and that it's not it's not the sales funny funnel linear journey that we've all been trained in our textbooks to expect that instead people are going to kind of flit all over the place. But that on you know on a not individual level but a cohort level, we would expect to see more people poking into that product store. Yeah, though, absolutely. And I think that's a key point, as you said, is to is to analyze, you know, figure out the data you need and then analyze it properly mm -hmm. uh, in order to draw, you know, proper conclusions as opposed to assumptions, which uh, we, we always love to do. Um, and the other piece I just wanted to ask you quickly uh, before the end is uh, the authentic word has been thrown around by mm -hmm. everybody today. It's become the, it's, it has to be the 2021 buzzword of the year, I think. Uh, and everybody's talking about communicating with authenticity, being authentic and all of that. So, I mean, how do you, how do you make sure that you are being authentic uh, and you are meeting that need for authenticity without forcing it, if you like, or, or faking it even? Yeah, how do you be authentically authentic? Yeah, there, <laughs> perfectly. Yeah, that's even you said it better. Perfect. Uh, you know, I, I think we gravitate towards a couple of other words. Credible is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, the other one that we ask ourselves is: Are we putting the the reader first? Um, in the sense of, are we, you know, again, not to become untethered to what we're trying to sure. achieve, but are we? you know, really prioritizing the experience that we want them to have. And then are we taking action in order to do so? Or are we pulling punches? And I think everybody has been there. We, I mean, we still do it sometimes where, you know, the thing that would really be most authentic to include in the piece sort of runs afoul of something that's a strategic priority for the company. And so, you know, there's a little line at it, you know, but, mm -hmm. but on the whole, we want to make sure that the gravity of the work is done through the mindset of how are we providing value to someone? And I think if you're just constantly asking yourself, you know, is this valuable for the person who's going to spend time with it? You know, then, uh, you know, and, and by the way, we've all seen the, the bait and switch thing where, you know, you draw somebody in with that great story, then it's like deus ex product by paragraph three. And, uh, you know, and that's the scenario we're trying to avoid. We want, we want someone, if we're always thinking about like, we want someone to spend one minute, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, consuming this thing that we've made, and 
it, you know, and, and, and they have to then think that that is time well spent worth the 10%, you know, in your lean methodology. I, you know, I, I think if you're just asking yourself that question over and over again, and you're able to, you know, really put yourself in the shoes of that reader and not the customer. I, I think that's the best way you can do it. Yeah, and I love that distinction that you make, and I think that's a great takeaway from everybody is putting yourself in the shoes of the reader and not necessarily putting yourself in the shoes of the customer, because obviously, um, you know, the customer has a very distinct, or when you become a customer, you've already anyway had, uh, yeah, right, exactly. had your, you bought it anyway. So, I mean, the idea of attracting attracting other people in, and I guess that's the other part, though, is the consistency of the experience, because this is where mm. I see a lot of people fall down. And I and I and I say that uh, with with all due respect to people, because it's hard because it is hard. Yeah. And, and I'll make a, a real strong point on this one. One of the things that we have learned through several years now of doing this and looking at behavior, measuring behavior is, you know, the experience you're creating is probably more important than the thing that you're actually putting in front, you know? And, you know, and I'm sure you've had this experience, you've had this experience where, you know, we have, you know, the CEO of some big publicly traded company and all their king's horses and all their king's men work with us to create something. And it's like the price tag in terms of important people's time for this one article is like astronomical, right? Um, and then, you know, the client takes, everybody feels great about it. And then the client might take it and just like put it on the wall on the internet. It's like this wall of text, you know, and, and nobody is going to begin to engage with it. It doesn't matter how good it is. You know, so much of like what we find is that half of people in general are going to leave a web page before they read a word of your content. And in the thing that more than anything else is going to impact whether they decide to begin engaging or not is the load time on the page, you know, is the UX of the blog inviting or uninviting? You know, is the headline clear? Uh, is the layout good? You know, do you have subheads? Do you have graphics? Things like that. And it doesn't matter what the words are if you can't engage them by thinking about the experience. And that just goes back to this point about empathy for the person who's in this case, not a reader, maybe a scroller, but, but and not just empathy in terms of what is the story you're telling, but also empathy in terms of what kind of experience are they having on what's honestly a very crowded internet. Yeah, well, I think that's a big point, isn't it? Like, it's a very crowded internet. It's a very noisy world out there. So you have to you you have to be able to get your message across pretty quickly. And I guess there you go. I mean, what you just outlined there is you know, somebody putting all of this text, uh, you know, on a web page. But if you ask them, say, okay, if this was somebody else, would you read it? Yeah, you don't even start. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't even start. So I think because this always just in in, in conclusion, this always fascinates me how. And I often say this about salespeople, but it's true about all, all roles, is that is that when we're when we're consumers ourselves and we expect things, or when we go on and we expect things uh, on when we're reading websites or whatever it is, um, but then when we cross the threshold of our own work, oh, we throw all that out the window and we think this is fine to push this stuff out. It's very, it's very strange. Uh where human nature is very strange. It, it, it's a totally it's a great observation. It's totally right. We all we we it's like the little lies that we tell ourselves, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly yeah and we always go oh well you know um, i had a terrible experience with this company when i was trying to buy something off them and then you give the same experience to the people who try to buy from you mm -hmm. um okay well in the um, just one last just, just one last question for you um everything you know there's a lot of digital transformation going on right now and i think certainly it had started before the pandemic and people i think people have paid a lot of lip service to it uh, pandemic really showed that if you don't have good digital processes in place, mm -hmm. you're really going to struggle. So what, from your point of view, how do you see the future of digital transformation and how do we adopt it and still keep the authentic or the credibility or the human element in there? You know, I think a lot of digital transformation turns out to be culture change more so than technology change or rather you know, you have a new technology uh, or even the thing that we do trying to create content, um, mm -hmm. but that new opportunity means that you have to work in a different way. You have to collaborate with people you hadn't collaborated with before. You have to work at a different cadence than you worked before. And that new cadence requires a different process. And the old process doesn't work. And so people are gonna be increasingly pulled out of their comfort zones. And sometimes it's gonna work 
and sometimes it's going to break. And, um, and, and again, I, you know, I've used this word probably 25 times already, you know, empathy, uh, for, you know, the human change that's going to take place. Um, you know, I think we see it in our work sometimes, sometimes it's easy. Sometimes we're asking people to exercise a muscle that they've never exercised before. Um, and, you know, so approaching it that way, um, but yeah, I think it's, I think, I think digital transformation, uh, the digital part is sometimes overused when I think really what we're talking about is, you know, people and culture transformation. Yeah, no, I think that's a fantastic point and a great takeaway for people. And also the fact is, yeah, digital transformation doesn't mean just taking processes as as is and just dumping them into some digital format or, or in using mm -hmm. some technology. Yeah, you really have to figure out how how the culture changes how the processes need to change how people's um you know roles need to change and yeah i think there's a i think there's a huge flattening happening across organizations and that's going to be difficult for especially for the people who love the uh you know good fences make good neighbors right right absolutely <laughs> well this has been fantastic ben all of ben's information is going to be below this video but before we go please do tell us more about yourself and message lab yeah, so we're Message Lab, messagelab.com, if I can get the plug in. And you know, we are a editorial first content agency uh, with a specialization in creating editorial experiences, doing journalism storytelling, uh, reaching audiences, building audiences for your ideas, and you know, and using data to show the connection between what you're making 